For 75 years, Argonne National Laboratory has accelerated the science and technology that drive U.S. security and prosperity. To celebrate, we're capturing the stories of the people who made it happen. This is Argonne Voices. For every Argonne scientist, training the next generation is one of the most important things he or she does. And at the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, known as Jay Caesar, mentors abound. Here, materials scientist Lynn Trahey talks with her longtime mentor, Jay Caesar director George Crabtree. George, I, <laughs> I heard your dad was a mechanical engineer, but I can imagine you also liking astronomy, botany. Did you feel diverse scientific interests or were you pretty locked into engineering and then physics? Uh, I was certainly interested in the way the physical world works. So I remember when I was in grade school, I thought it would be fun. We used to have rabbits running around in our backyard. I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to track the trails that the rabbits are on, run all the time? So I got out a piece of paper and a pencil and I just went outside and watched the rabbits and where they went. And it turned out a lot of them had a rabbit hole under our garage. No one knew this, <laughs> except I found it out because I was watching the rabbits. And I was showing this to my family, my parents, you know, one day, look where the rabbits are. And they were saying, under our garage? Are you kidding? And, you know, they were not exactly happy about it. I don't really know why, but they weren't. But that's an example of just straight curiosity. So, George, can you tell me about working on the J. Caesar proposal and how it felt when you learned that it was awarded? Yeah, what a shock. I mean, J. Caesar, which, of course, stands for the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. So the best battery in the world is the lithium-ion battery, which has been around since 1991 and does lots of things, like powers our personal electronics. It's going to power all the EVs, electric vehicles that we're going to buy. And it's in the grid. So it's amazing how much it can do. But it can't do everything. And it's Jay Caesar's uh, task and vision to look beyond the lithium ion battery and invent the next generation. We're looking at another 10 years of energy storage research. There's still plenty of white space out there for us to go after. So, why were you interested in chemistry? Chemistry in particular, I had a, a love with because of the periodic table. It was just so beautiful to me, and it still is. And when I learned that everything I can imagine is somewhere here, and everything that's going to be invented is somewhere here, and there's parts of this that we don't yet understand, I thought that with my curiosity and my want of problem solving, this is a tool that I need to understand more. And this was around the year 2000, and global warming, climate change, that was weighing heavily on me back then. <laughs> that won't change for the rest of my life, but at least I'm able to work toward solutions to those problems. And I will tell you, that's one thing that gives me great pleasure, the fact that we're working on energy storage and we have been in Jay Caesar for about eight years, which is really quite satisfying. I look back at what my parents went through, and they were in the generation that lived through the Depression and World War II. And uh, I think to myself, they solved so many problems. And I look now the next generation, I think their problem is going to be climate change. It's going to get much worse than it is now. And it will fall to the developed countries like the US and Europe to really help solve that problem. And the research that we're doing now in batteries and energy storage, that's exactly what's needed. So we're right in the middle of kind of another potentially great generation to actually solve these things. Yeah, exactly. And batteries, I feel like I navigated toward batteries wanting to do something that was easier to talk to people about than what I had done before, which was the thermoelectrics. Just having a, a different field that I could talk to people about without them backing away was attractive to me. And you were saying earlier your fascination with the periodic table. I had a similar experience with my father. I picked up something, a rock, I forgot what it What is this made out of? I asked my father. He said, oh, it's made out of atoms. I said, atoms? What's that? And he's trying to tell me what an atom was. And then he said, yeah, everything is made out of atoms. And I said, no, everything can't be made out of atoms. Is a leaf made out of atoms? Yeah, leaf is made out of atoms. And I had three or four more. Well, how about my shirt? Is my shirt made out of atoms? Yes, your shirt is made out of atoms. 
And that stuck with me. I thought, how can that be? These things are so different, these materials. They can't all be made out of atoms. And they're just these hundred or so atoms in the periodic table. And boy, are they ever diverse. So it's an example of curiosity and even being um, critical, like, oh, I don't believe that. And then realizing later on with enough thought, yeah, I guess it is right. So Lynn, tell me a little bit about women in science. How about talking about the challenges a little bit? It started off kind of easy as a woman in science. I was in a very female-oriented group in grad school. It was a small group, but we, I think, always maintained a majority of, of women in that group. But since then, my new normal is being one of few women in most rooms. But if I'm in a room with only men, maybe I'm a little bit more compelled to be heard When I think about myself in science, I hope that I provide more normalcy to just seeing and hearing women with scientific authority. If that's unusual to someone, it doesn't need to be. So we're out there, we're speaking with authority. I've been also pretty lucky in that I haven't felt limited because of my gender. I haven't blocked my own thinking, my own imagination as to what I can be just because there hasn't been a female doing it yet. So I'm not in my own way. And that's that's a triumph. That's important. Hey, Lynn, what a pleasure to talk to you. We've gotten to know each other in ways that we didn't before, even though we're already very good friends and colleagues. But what a pleasure to just sit here and talk. It's the easiest part of my day is just chatting with you like this. Thank you. Thanks, George. Argonne Voices is an oral history project, recording the stories behind decades of world-changing science at the laboratory. To learn more about Argonne's 75th anniversary, visit anl.gov.